You're listening to Do This First, a daily personal development podcast that focuses on science-backed, actionable steps towards your best year ever. Hi, I'm Sandy, your host. Today, we're continuing with our 10-part Mind Matter Brain Health series. Today's episode will focus on CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, and Cognitive Training. Let's first start with CBT. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or CBT, as widely used, is a form of psychotherapy. It focuses on changing negative patterns of thinking and behavior to improve emotional regulation and overall mental health. This therapeutic approach is based on the premise that our thoughts, our feelings, and our behaviors are interconnected, and by changing our cognitions, we can positively influence our emotions and actions. CBT emerged in the 1960s and was mainly developed by Aaron T. Beck and Albert Ellis. Aaron T. Beck's Cognitive Theory of Emotional Disorders and Albert Ellis's Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy both laid the foundation. These pioneers identified the role of irrational thoughts and beliefs in causing emotional distress and develop structured techniques to challenge and modify them. Early treatment focused on identifying and challenging irrational beliefs and cognitive distortions, such as all or nothing thinking, catastrophizing, and personalization. By helping people recognize and restructure these maladaptive thought patterns, therapists aim to alleviate symptoms of depression, anxiety, and other physiological disorders. One of key aspects of CBT's evolution has been its integration with behavioral techniques. Early CBT primarily emphasized cognitive restructuring, but the incorporation of behavioral strategies such as exposure therapy and behavioral experiments enriched the effectiveness of the therapy. This comprehensive approach addresses both cognitive processes and behavioral patterns leading to more profound and long-lasting therapeutic outcomes. CBT's evolution also involves the development of specialized protocols for various mental health issues, including anxiety disorders, mood disorders, eating disorders, and substance abuse. These tailored interventions have made CBT a versatile and empirically supported treatment for a wide range of physiological conditions. While CBT was not a direct response to other type of treatments that were ineffective, it did, however, emerge as a more structured and goal-oriented alternative to traditional psychodynamic approaches. CBT's emphasis on present-focused problem-solving, collaboration between therapists and clients, and evidence-based techniques made it particularly appealing for people seeking practical and time-limited interventions for their mental health concerns. Some of the conditions that are treated by leveraging CBT include PTSD, anxiety, anger, chronic pain, sleep disorders, and stress. All situations don't necessarily require professional help. Here are situations that do. Number one, persistent symptoms. If emotional or psychological symptoms such as persistent sadness, anxiety, irritability, hopelessness, or anger are present and lasting for an extended period, it may be a sign that professional help is needed. Number two, interference with daily life. When symptoms interfere with one's ability to perform daily tasks and maintain relationships and concentrate on work or school or engage in activities that you once enjoyed, seeking help is crucial. Number three, difficulty coping. If you're finding it challenging to cope with stress, manage emotions, or deal with life's transitions, talking to a mental health professional can provide support and guidance. And substance use. Increased reliance on alcohol, drugs, or other substances to cope with emotional distress can signal the need for professional intervention to address underlying issues. Five, any thoughts of self-harm should be taken seriously and immediate professional help should be sought by contacting a mental health provider, a crisis hotline, or going to the nearest emergency room. 
Number six, relationship issues. If relationships with family, friends, or partners are strained due to communication difficulties, conflict, or emotional issues, seeking couples or family therapy can be beneficial as well. And then there's past trauma. If you've experienced past trauma, abuse, or significant life events that continue to impact your mental well-being and functioning, seeking help from a therapist experience in trauma treatment can be beneficial. And then the persistent stress. Chronic stress is affecting your mental and physical health. Learning stress management techniques through therapy can help you cope more effectively. And lastly, a desire for personal growth, which is what this podcast is all about. That can also be a good reason to employ cognitive behavioral therapy. Seeking therapy or counseling is not solely for addressing problems. It can also be valuable for personal growth, self-awareness, and developing coping strategies for future challenges. Cognitive behavioral therapy primarily focuses on improving individuals' thoughts and behaviors to alleviate psychological symptoms and enhance emotional well-being. While it's not specifically designed to boost brain cells or function in the same way cognitive training is, which we'll talk about in a minute, or neurofeedback programs, there are indirect ways in which T can positively impact brain health by influencing neuroplasticity, stress reduction, sleep improvement, and enhanced coping strategies, all of which can support brain health. CBT's ability to address psychological distress improve coping strategies, and promote effective emotional regulation can contribute to overall well-being, which in turn can positively influence brain health and cognitive functioning. It is essential to complement CBT with other brain healthy practices, such as physical exercise, healthy nutrition, regular sleep, and cognitive stimulation for comprehensive brain health support. On the other hand, cognitive training, as mentioned previously, has a more direct impact on brain health, and it's something almost all of us can do on a consistent basis. Here are just a few examples. So limiting multitasking. Limiting multitasking can improve attention, concentration, cognitive efficiency, and overall brain health. While many people believe that multitasking makes them more productive, Research suggests that attempting to perform multiple tasks simultaneously can actually reduce efficiency and impair cognitive performance. Here's how limiting multitasking can really benefit our brain health. Improved attention by focusing on one task at a time as opposed to multitasking, you can allocate your attention more effectively leading to better concentration on the task at hand. This can result in improved productivity and reduced errors compared to dividing your attention among multiple tasks. Number two, enhanced concentration. Concentrating on one task allows you to enter into a state of deep focus known as flow which we have a podcast episode dedicated to flow, where your attention is fully engaged and you are more likely to achieve optimal performance. This can lead to higher quality work and a greater sense of satisfaction with your accomplishments. Number three, increase cognitive efficiency. When you concentrate on a single task, you can dedicate your cognitive resources fully to that activity. That enables you to complete it more efficiently and effectively. This can lead to better problem solving skills, decision making, and overall cognitive performance. And number four, reduced mental fatigue. Multitasking can mentally tax and exhaust your brain to have to constantly switch between tasks leading to cognitive overload. This is not good for our brain health. By focusing on one task at a time, you can reduce mental fatigue and prevent burnout, ultimately improving overall brain health and well-being. Enhanced memory, number five. When you focus on a single task, your brain can better encode and retrieve info related to that task, leading to improved memory consolidation and retention. 
multitasking can hinder memory formation by dividing your attention and cognitive resources. And lastly, prevention of cognitive overload. Multitasking can overload and overwhelm the brain's cognitive systems, leading to decreased performance, increased stress, and impaired decision-making abilities over time. By limiting multitasking and focusing on one task at a time, you can prevent cognitive overload and maintain optimal cognitive function. Limiting multitasking can benefit attention, concentration, cognitive efficiency, and overall brain health by promoting focused attention, reducing cognitive load, enhancing cognitive performance, and preventing mental fatigue. Another thing that can improve your brain health and that is part of cognitive training is staying hydrated. Yeah, proper hydration is essential for optimal brain function as dehydration can negatively impact cognitive abilities such as memory, focus, and mood. Drink an adequate amount of water daily to support cognitive health. Another thing that goes a long way in cognitive training is practice visualization and memory techniques. Use visualization techniques, mnemonic devices, and memory strategies to improve recall, enhance learning, and strengthen cognitive abilities related to memory and information processing. Another thing that ties into cognitive training is to seek variety and novelty. Incorporate new experiences, challenges, and learning opportunities into your routine to stimulate different areas of the brain. Promote neuroplasticity and enhance cognitive flexibility and creativity by seeking variety and novelty. By incorporating these cognitive training hacks into your daily life, you can support brain function, promote cognitive health, and enhance overall well-being. Consider practicing these strategies to help maintain cognitive vitality, improve cognitive performance, and support a healthy brain across the lifespan. I'd also like to suggest a book on cognitive training that is informative and easy to follow. It's called Keep Your Brain Alive, 85 Exercises to help prevent memory loss and increase mental fitness. It's by Lawrence Katz and Manning Rubin. This book offers practical and simple exercises designed to stimulate different parts of the brain, improve cognitive function, and promote brain health. Each exercise is easy to implement in daily life and is aimed at challenging the brain in novel ways to keep it sharp and agile. The book presents these exercises in a clear and engaging manner making it a user-friendly guide for individuals looking to enhance their mental fitness. If you like what you're hearing, don't forget to leave a review. You can also read a full transcript of this podcast episode and all 161 podcast episodes and counting on my blog at dothisfirst.life. You can also sign up for my new weekly newsletter, which will help you get your week started on a positive note and updates on coaching, books, merch, and my public speaking engagements as they become available. Tomorrow, we'll unpack installment seven of our Brain Health series. Until tomorrow. Moving back.